Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Out of curiosity, has anybody here ever heard of the term a living bridge before? A living bridge? It was a new term to me, too. I hadn't heard of it before until pretty recently. I was watching a nature documentary. And in parts of northern India, where there's dense jungle and rainforest, there's a lot of rivers and creeks and brooks. There's a lot of waterways that need to cross over. So what the people locally have done is they would take a tree that was already growing on the bank of the river, and they would physically manipulate the roots and prop them up and kind of um, move them. So gradually they would grow in a particular direction. And they would tie supports to them, they would wait until the root got stronger and denser, and they would keep drawing out further and further. And they keep doing this until finally the roots from that tree reach all the way to the other side of the bank. And so you can cross back and forth. It's called a living bridge. And the thing about those bridges is that they take a really, really long time to make, as you would imagine. It's the lifetime of a tree. It takes generations. Some of those have taken centuries to get as strong as they are so that people can walk with them. Which is fascinating because that means that the people who started those bridges, the first people who dug up those roots and started manipulating them, grafting them and supporting them in the right direction, that means those people knew that they weren't going to directly benefit from the outcome. They knew that they weren't going to be the ones to see what would happen with it all. But that it was something worth doing anyway, that it was worth preparing for future generations yet to come. And that notion, that image of a living bridge has been in my head for this last week or so as I've been praying about and reading and reflecting on this gospel this week. Because that seems to describe John in some ways. Preparing something that he doesn't get to see the outcome of. John the Baptist is this wild and enigmatic figure out in the wilderness, baptizing, yelling at people, dunking them up underwater. And then he finally finds Jesus. The Holy Spirit descends upon them, and Christ's ministry begins. But John kind of disappears from the Gospels after that point. We don't hear a lot about John the Baptist after that. Not until much later. Later, when he's finally arrested by King Herod, he's in jail, and he hears about what Jesus has been doing. So he sends one of his messengers to Jesus to ask him, are you the one, or are we to wait for another? He doesn't know, because he hasn't seen, seen the results. Herod ends up beheading him while he's in prison. He spent all this time preparing the way for Jesus to be revealed, to be baptized, to be called out. But then he dies before he sees that ministry at work. Which seems very appropriate for this season of Advent. Because this whole season is about preparing, about getting ready for things to come. Sometimes we get to see the end result, and sometimes we don't. Not until the day that we finally enter the kingdom yet to come, and all that work finally makes sense. But in this season of Advent, it's all about preparing and getting ready. And it's so easy for us to get distracted during this time, isn't it? There's all the preparations that need to happen with holidays, decorations that go up, a lot of family meals that need to be made, cleaning that needs to happen before guests come. It's a very busy time. It feels like we're preparing, doesn't it? But all of that stuff, that's not what this is about. That's not what Advent is for. That's not what Christmas is about. It's about Christ. It's about Jesus coming into the world. It's about God descending down into the world, being made man, becoming part of his own creation, being killed and crucified by it, ascending into heaven so that we can follow after. Advent and Christmas, it's about the nativity. It's about Jesus. And this is a time that we can use to prepare our hearts, to prepare our souls, 
so that Jesus can be born anew inside of us, so that we can bring him out into the world, so that we can be his hands and feet wherever we go. It's one of the things I've been thinking about a lot this week. Because the more I think about that image of a living bridge, the more I realize that Christ is the living bridge. Christ is that unity between heaven and earth that we all follow and reach into our salvation. This is a time that we can use to prepare, to pay attention, to listen, and to see Christ. That is the point of it. Not the gifts, not the meals, not all the busyness that happens within it. But Christ. When we can keep our hearts and minds fixed on that, when we can prepare ourselves for his arrival, then we become grafted onto that living bridge. We become part of that heritage, preparing the way for others, helping them as best we can. We don't always see the outcome of our work, but our job is to till the soil as best we can plant seeds knowing that we might not rest in the shade of trees that grow from them. Our whole life, in some ways, is a time of preparation, getting ready for that time when we finally exit this world and see God face to face. It's a journey. Father Eric might say it's a kind of Camino, because it's a moving forward and getting ready. In this season of Advent, this holiday time as we prepare for Christmas and all the celebrations that happen with it, my prayer for all of us is that we enjoy that time, we enjoy that celebration, but that we don't get distracted by it, that we use it as a time of prayer and meditation so that Christ may be born anew into us, that we may be grafted onto that bridge.